Hey everybody, it's only been a couple of weeks since I posted a video talking about a book, but it feels like it's been six weeks since I talked about a book. I essentially have been unable to read through the entire month of May so far, and I don't see that stopping anytime soon. Just a combination of being really busy and having all this added work stress right now and some crazier things going on in my life. I'm fine, don't worry about any of that stuff. It's just one of those times of the year where everything seems to be happening at the same time and when that happens I don't have a lot of energy to give to books even the ones that I'm really excited about so unfortunately I've had to cancel a lot of my reading plans throughout May. I was supposed to be in a book club this month and I canceled that. I was supposed to read one of the books I'm going to be talking about very soon in this video and I had to kind of cancel that reading. Um, I was gonna read another book uh, with my friend Tanner this month, so I've had to postpone that a little bit because I just don't have the mental bandwidth to devote to any anything right now. It's, oh, it sucks. But it's going to go away at a certain point. I know how these things go. We get in these ruts. We think we're never going to read again, and within a week or two or three, we're fine and everything's back to normal. So that's what I'm hoping is going to happen, and it better happen if what I'm going to be talking about in this video has any hope of occurring. So what are we talking about today? Today we're talking about something that I have participated in here on BookTube for a couple of years now. It's originated with my friend Kathy on her blog. I will link to her blog below, but she does this thing every summer called the 20 Books of Summer, where you make a list of 20 books that you want to get through between June 1st and September 1st. And the kicker is that you have to review every book that you read. So I brought this over to YouTube a couple of years ago. I love doing it every year, even though I have not read the full 20 books in the list that I've made any year that I've done this. It's me, of course I'm not gonna do that. But I love the challenge. I love making just a stack of books that I try to get through throughout the summer. It's fun, it's aspirational. You get to kind of go through your shelves and pick 20 books that you're just excited to read. You know, whether you read them or not, it's fun. So I will try to review as many as I can uh, here on the channel, but I also could be doing that on Instagram as well. So if you don't follow me on Instagram, I have a link to that account below as well. And without further ado, let's just get into the books. So today I'm going to talk about what the 20 books are for my 20 books of summer, and uh, let's get to it. The first book I'm going to talk about is a book everybody knows. It's the book I just referenced having uh, had to cancel a read-along for that book, and that is My Brilliant Friend by Elena Ferrante. I don't need to say much about this other than the fact that I'm so glad I got this version of these books. If you know, you know. I definitely still do want to read this book even though I cannot read in the timeline that, uh, that my friends are also reading this book. So I'm definitely going to get to it. I got about 50 pages into it actually uh, at the very start of the month and then uh, had to put it down because again, I haven't been able to read anything. The next book I'm gonna talk about is the next book in my reading of Sarah Hall's books. I don't know if you will remember, but I'm trying to read through all of Sarah Hall's bibliography. How to Paint a Dead Man, I believe is her fourth book. So I'm going to uh, read this one this summer. All I know about this book is that it's about four people across like a half century going uh, between England and Italy. A dying painter considers the sacrifices and losses that have made him an enigma. A blind girl tries to make sense of a world she can no longer see. A landscape artist finds himself trapped in dangerous terrain, and a young woman embarks on a dangerous affair of darkness and sexual abandon. I love Sarah Hall. I've had such a wonderful time reading through her books. This one is described as an intelligent page turner, so very excited about that one. Next is a book that I'm planning to read because I've just been kind of like accidentally reading about and listening to things about Ram Dass and meditation and his time at Harvard and how him and his friends were really getting into LSD and how they were trying to use it to find some other kind of um, human experience. Using LSD as almost like a belief system, something that would allow them to see God or, or other realities or just open their mind to a new way of being and understanding the world. And even though I would never, I don't think, really do those things or go there, I bought this book probably about a year ago, Outside Looking In by T.C. Boyle, um, and it just happens to be about all that stuff. Fitzhugh Loney, a psychology PhD student and his wife Joni, become entranced by the drug's possibilities such that their research becomes less a matter of clinical trials and academic papers and instead turns into a freewheeling exploration of mind expansion, group dynamics, 
and communal living. It's about this same set of students at Harvard. It's about this psychedelic drug uh, enthusiast, Timothy Leary. I read T.C. Boyle's book, The Terranauts, a couple of years ago, and I quite liked it. So um, yeah, gonna give it a shot. Next is a book that I keep saying I'm going to read every single year, and I just don't. Um, so what better time to add this to the list? And that's Transcendent Kingdom by Yajasi. Gifty is determined to discover the scientific basis for the suffering she sees all around her. But even as she turns to the hard sciences to unlock the mystery of her family's loss, she finds herself hungering for her childhood faith and grappling with the evangelical church in which she was raised, whose promise of salvation remains as tantalizing as it is elusive. Like that's, that's a wreck book in a nutshell if I've ever heard of one. The next book, No One Is Talking About This by Patricia Lockwood. A lot of people I know who are really smart people and have really great taste in books have really liked this book, but it's also a bit of a divisive one. It seems to be a book that you either love or hate. And I do trust the people who have recommended it to me, but there's a line from the inside cover here that just gives me a little bit of trepidation. It says, fragmentary and omniscient, no one is talking about this, is at once a love letter to the endless scroll in a profound modern meditation on love, language, and human connection. Now, the first part of that, or the second part of that sounds really great. The first part of that scares the crap out of me. A love letter to the endless scroll sounds like a book I absolutely do not want to read, and I don't know why someone would write that. There's gonna be uh, some noise outside here as I talk about this because there's a dump truck picking up some garbage right outside, so great for filming. Yeah, I don't know why Someone would write a love letter to the Endless Scroll. The Endless Scroll seems like something um, that is just universally panned and no one likes that part of the internet. Why is this happening right now? So I don't know why someone would write a book about that. I don't know why that would be interesting unless it's just kind of making fun of all of us because we're all, we all get hooked into this thing, but it is like a love letter to, I don't know. I think that one's gonna go one of two ways. Uh, I'm excited to give it a shot. It seems like it's kind of a brisk read. So whether it's, uh, good or bad, I think I'll still be able to get through it, but this is just terrible. Okay, this next book, Eleutheria by Allegra Hyde, is a book that I only bought because author Matt Bell, who I love so much, uh, recommended this on Twitter when it was coming out, and I was in full-blown obsessed with Matt Bell mode at the time, so it sounded like an interesting book. It sounded like it was somewhat connected, um, to the book he had just written, which I loved. So I pre-ordered it and it came in and I've kind of forgotten all about it, but I just looked at my shelf today and I, I, I kind of was like, oh, oh yeah, this book, the, this book had come out and it sounds so interesting. So I'm hoping I actually get to it. And I just want to read you the back cover of it because it does sound fascinating. Willa Marks has spent her whole life choosing hope. She chooses hope over her parents' paranoid conspiracy theories, over her dead end job, over the rising ocean levels. And when she meets Sylvia Gill, renowned Harvard professor, she feels she's found justification for that hope. Sylvia is the woman in black, the only person who can compel the world to action. But when Sylvia betrays her, Willa fears she has lost hope forever. And then she finds a book in Sylvia's library, a guide to fighting climate change called Living the Solution. Inspired by its message and with nothing to lose, Willa flies to the island of Eleutheria in the Bahamas to join the author and his group of eco-warriors at Camp Hope. But upon arrival, the group's leader, author Roy Adams, goes missing and the compound's public launch is delayed. With time running out, Willow will stop at nothing to realize Camp Hope's mission, but at what cost? I'm not a big like environmental disaster reader, but that sounds really, really good. So I will trust in uh, Matt Bell. I will trust in the person who wrote the back cover copy for that book because they did a great job. Next is a trinity of books that I had on my list in this video last year. So the 20 books of summer for 2021 had the following three books in it and I didn't read them. So I wanted to add them to the list again this year. The first is The Performance by Claire Thomas, matches my shirt quite well. This is a book about three women who go to see a theater performance. And while the performance unfolds on stage, so does the compelling trajectory that will bring the women together. By the time the curtain falls, they will all have a new understanding of the world beyond the stage. This is a slim little volume. It's like 220 pages long. It's been very highly recommended by a number of people I know, critically uh, well received. There's no reason I won't or shouldn't read this book. It's got a beautiful cover. It's nice to hold. 
It's about subject matter that I find interesting. It's just like a really weird, um, just different premise. Yeah, there's no reason I, I shouldn't read this book this year. The next one is Unsettled Ground by Claire Fuller. And I really, I feel like I have to finish this book this year or Jill uh, is gonna kill me. Um, she's, she goes by the book bully here on um, YouTube and she will prove it to me if I don't read this book this year, I'm pretty sure. Cause she has um, spoken as highly of this book as anybody I know. And I've said I'm going to read it a couple of times, <laughs> including this time last year. So I really, really have to read it this summer. Uh, otherwise, I might be dead. Uh, next um, is a book called The Bridge by Keith Maillard. Again, this is a book that I was supposed to read last year. I picked this up last year because I had read Keith Maillard's book, Twin Studies, which I absolutely just adored. And The Bridge is about the fact that Keith Maillard has been living this kind of non-binary lifestyle for decades and decades and decades. He's in his 70s now, I think, and he's been living this non-binary lifestyle just without being able to give the, the current, you know, wording to it for, for, I think, over half his life. In this stunning memoir, Maillard creates an intricate collage of childhood memories, exploring the contradictory forces at work that put his very life at risk. For young Keith, writing proved to be a way to fight against what the world was telling him. In his scribbled stories, he began to spot the faintest glimmer that things could be different. And he kept fighting for years and decades until he found a new understanding of his own non-binary identity. The bridge reveals the dangers of the gender binary, both for those who are outside it and for those who aren't. And it offers hope for a kinder future for all who dare to say no to the way that we do gender. Next are three books that are tiny, tiny little books that I hope will help me get through reading 20 books over the course of three months. Um, the first is Fate by Jorge Concilio. Concilio? Jorge Concilio? I really hope I pronounce that right. The book is about a couple named Carl and Marina. Carl is a kind of world-renowned oboist and Marina is a meteorologist. While she is on a field trip, she meets uh, another man, uh, has a fling with him, which very quickly I think turns into not a fling and it starts to potentially erode her marriage. Then there's this secondary story of a man named Amir who goes to this kind of smokers anonymous group and he meets a young woman there and he starts to fall for her. So the story is kind of going back and forth between one marriage um, falling apart and another relationship just beginning. But in regards to the relationship that is just beginning, it also says, or is it already at an end? I know a couple of people who have read it. I bought it without them uh, telling me it was really good. But then once I bought it, a couple of people reached out and said, oh, I, I read that book. It's really good. So yeah, another one, it's, it's tiny. It's what a ridiculous way to say I want to read a book. I heard about it and it was really good. So I bought it and I hope it's good. Uh, it's only like 118 pages. So it'll go by really fast. And that's not even the shortest book in my stack here because I got a book um, just last week or maybe two weeks ago. That is 95 pages long. It is barely called a book. It is Cold Enough for Snow, a novel by Jessica O. Ow. I don't know how to pronounce her name either. A-U. I'm not coming off great in this one. My friend Jason Purcell, whose book Swollening I reviewed uh, a couple of months ago here on the channel, recommended this book to me. It's the winner of uh, the funniest book prize I think I've ever heard of. It's the inaugural winner of the Novel Prize. First of all, it's called the Novel Prize, which is so unimaginative, it's hilarious. Also, is it a novel? It's 95 pages long. It's the first winner of the Novel Prize, and that's not even a novel, that is a novella. This book is said to be kind of a, an exploration of our the, the mysteries of our relation to other people. And the book is about a mother and a daughter who travel from abroad to Tokyo. And I think it just follows them as they walk through Tokyo for one day. They go to small cafes and restaurants, they visit galleries. All the while they talk about the weather, horoscopes, clothes, objects, about family, distance, and memory. But uncertainties abound. Who is really speaking? And what is the real reason for this elliptical, perhaps even spectral journey? It's not a book that I normally would pick up, I think, but it's been recommended very, very highly. So uh, I'll give it a go. Again, it's only 100 pages long. You can read that in an afternoon, no problem. Next is a book that I've been kind of fighting against reading for a while because I hated the first cover of the book so much. 
And I'm not, I'm still not sure how I feel about this new cover. That's the Employees by Olga Raven. Raven, I don't know how to pronounce any of these people's names. This has been described to me as like a science fiction story I absolutely need to read. And it's also been described as like one of the weirder stories um, some people have ever read. So that's usually not my jam. Luckily, again, it is only 133 pages long in this edition. It was shortlisted for the International Booker last year. A lot of people I know and trust do really, really like this book, but it's just, it doesn't sound like a book that I'm gonna love, but we'll see. I really only bought this book because I was traveling a couple of weeks ago and every time I'm in a new city, I have to go to a bookshop and buy a book. And there was nothing else that really jumped out to me that day. And I saw that this had a new cover and it was so small and slim. And I'm like, I could actually read it, make a, make a couple of people I know happy, unless I, hate it, that'll make them really mad. Next is the only book on this list that is a reread. That is The Ravine by Paul Quarrington. This is a book that I credit for reinvigorating my relationship, or maybe invigorating it for the first time, with Canadian literature. Back in 2008, I um, went to Ryerson University in Toronto to take the publishing program there. I wanted to work in publishing, Canadian publishing, as an editor. And while I was in that program, I realized I didn't read a lot of canlit books. I disliked a lot of canlit books at that time because as a, like a young 20s male, I was just really annoyed at a lot of canlit that we were taught in school was really bland and boring and slow. And it was about man's relationship to nature. And it was all always about just like either the East Coast being really barren or the prairies being really barren or life in the 50s being really barren. And these people had to re had to live these just really tough, just hard scrabble lives just to, just to get through it. And I just hated all of it. And while I was in that program, I just realized like, if you're gonna work in Canadian publishing, you have to get connected to what is currently happening in Canadian publishing. And so the Giller Prize for that year, when the long list came out, I made a, a, a promise to myself that I was gonna read every book from the Giller long list that year. And I think the first book that I picked up from the long list that year was The Ravine. And it remains like one of my favorite books I've ever read. It's one of the most impactful books that I've ever read. And I'm at a place in my life where I really, really wanna relive this story. I think I'm gonna come at it from an entirely different point of view. There was an event that happens to the main character in this book, his name is uh, Phil. So when he was young, him and his brother and one of their friends went down into a ravine and something terrible happened down there and it really, really impacted the rest of his life. It was something that he buried for a long time and in burying it, it just eroded him from the inside and, and just ate him alive. And by the time this book is starting, he is divorced, he has lost his job and uh, of a t on a TV show that he works for and and uh, the star of that TV show I think has died. So he's at a point where he's just incredibly depressed, he's self-medicating and the book basically just sets him on this redemptive quest to figure out what happened while he was down there when he was a kid and if there's any coming back from that. The next two books are the two short story collections that I hope to read this summer. The first is Skinship by Yoon Choi. This is a book that I pre-ordered a couple of months ago and then forgot that I did that. And then last week or the week before it came in. This is what's funny with pre-ordering in me. I don't remotely remember why I got this. I don't remember anybody talking about it. The first time I, I picked it up in the store, when I, when I picked it up, um, it looked like I'd never seen the book before or heard the title or heard of Yoon Choi. I have no idea <laughs> why I, uh, I pre-ordered this. I, I guarantee it was because some author on Twitter said something about it or said something nice, but that's the only information that I have. But since I picked it up, I have seen a number of people on Instagram talking about it and how good it is. So um, let's cross our fingers. I don't read a ton of short story collections, so it's not exactly up my alley, but again, that's part of the reason I'm excited to read it because I wouldn't have ordered it if there wasn't something that kind of caught my eye at the time. So really weird one. Um, so hopefully it goes well. And the second uh, short story collection, is, you know, with the lovely title, The Whore's Child and Other Stories by Richard Russo. Just as with Sarah Hall, last year I spent um, a good chunk of my year trying to read through Richard Russo's bibliography. I think I'm five books now through his bibliography. This is 
uh, his first short story collection. The only reason I'm reading this is because it's Richard Russo. Again, I don't read a lot of short story collections. I am not taken by the title of it at all, but it's Richard Russo, so I will trust him. Next is a book that is not here yet, but I know I'm going to buy. By the way, I should say, every book that I have here, I, one of the big things with 20 Books of Summer every year is reading books that I currently own, so I'm trying to pick books that I don't have to buy. This is the one exception. Uh, briefly, I don't know if you can read that. Uh, you can't read it, it's too blurry. Briefly, A Delicious Life by Nell Stevens is coming out July 19th. I have read uh, Nell Stevens' two um, memoirs and I love them, they're fantastic. And Briefly, A Delicious Life is her first novel and her first memoir was about the process of trying to write her first novel and it just went terribly. And, th and the failure of that turned into a memoir. So I'm just so proud of her for actually writing a book, getting it published, it's going out into the world. I've heard mixed things about it, which w makes me worry a little bit, but I, I love her memoir so much, I, find, I would find it very weird if I didn't like her, her novel. So I'm, that's probably the, the book I'm most excited to read for the rest of the year, actually. And finally, I have four chunkers here to finish uh, this off. These are the ones that scare me because I'm trying to read 20 books in three months, and um, a couple of these are in the like 600 page range. So we'll see how it goes. The first one is a group read along that just started yesterday technically but I'm not going to be able to start it right away. That's The Game of Kings by Dorothy Dunnett. This is the first book in the uh, Lyman Chronicles. The only reason I'm reading this book is because my friend Chelsea is a huge 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 fan of this series and we both love a lot of the same things so I really trust her passion on this one. It's historical fiction which I don't read a ton of but I, I typically really like when I do and this is what it's about. It is 1547 and after five years imprisonment and exile far from his homeland, Francis Crawford of Lyman, scholar, soldier, rebel, nobleman, outlaw, returns to Edinburgh. But for many in an already divided Scotland where conspiracies swarm around the infant Queen Mary, he is not welcome. Lyman is wanted for treason and murder, and he is accompanied by a band of killers and ruffians ready for violence. Is he back to foment rebellion? Does he seek revenge on those who banished him? Or has he returned to clear his name? No one but the enigmatic Lyman himself knows the truth, and no one will discover it until he is ready. It sounds really good, right? Uh, it's the first book in a series of six. All I know about it is that it is quite overwhelming when the story starts, but by the end of book one, you're just totally hooked uh, and you kind of can't stop. So I'll cross my fingers that that does happen. The next book might be the biggest book, yeah, of the summer. Oh, this scares the crap out of me. Uh, it's 675 pages long. Um, that is We the Drowned by Karsten Jensen. My really good friend, Yes Burr, is Danish. This is just like one of the crown jewels of Danish literature. Yes Burr has been telling me to read this book for a couple of years, I'm so excited. Um, I think that I'm, that I'm going to read this book. So Yes Burr, if you're watching, I hope I do get to it, but God, it's so long. And if I wanna read all these books <laughs> in a couple of months, the, I feel like the big ones are the one that I'm gonna, you know, avoid. Um, but this is a book that I've, I've owned for years and years and years. I've really, really wanted to read it. I've wanted to read it even before I met Jesper. So that, that bodes well, I think. I love nautical stories. This is described as a brilliant seafaring novel, a gripping saga encompassing industrial growth, years of expansion and exploration, the crucible of the first half of the 20th century, and most of all, the sea. So yeah, I hope uh, I get to it. Uh, Jesper, don't be mad if I don't. Um, next is a book that I got because I was aware of this book, but it was recommended by author Stephen Markley, whose book Ohio I loved so, so much last year, the year before. Um, that's Aurora by Kim Stanley Robinson. This is a book that I was aware of before um, his recommendation, but I, I, I forget where I actually read it. Something online where someone asked him, you know, for a book recommendation and he gave just such a heartfelt pleading review of Aurora. And I don't read a lot of science fiction. I'm someone who, who claims to love science fiction. I just don't read much of it at all. So I'm hoping this is a bit of a gateway drug for me, recommended by an author I really love. And finally, it's a bit of an atypical book for me. It's a book that I swore I would never read, but I am friends with a guy named Tanner on Instagram. Uh, he's become a good friend of mine. And we decided a couple months ago that we were gonna buddy read a book together. We weren't really sure what it was going to be. Um, so kind of left it up to Tanner to decide, and uh, he was kind of reading through all of Jonathan Franzen's books and decided he wanted to read Crossroads 
by Jonathan Franzen. Now, Franzen was an author that I pretty much said I would never read again. I don't, I don't hate Jonathan Franzen. I have no issues with Jonathan Franzen. I've just read a couple of his books and just felt like he wasn't for me for whatever reason. But it's been a couple of years since I've tried um, and I've heard like nothing but like extraordinarily good things about Crossroads and the fact that he's writing this as part of a trilogy, which is really interesting. A couple of my really, really good book friends love this book. So it, it kind of changed my mind. I'm gonna give him one last go. Hopefully reading it with another person would be uh, really fun. It might be a, a better way to get into Franzen, but we'll see, we'll see what life has to say. So there it is, that's 20 books. That's my 20 books of summer 2022. I was tempted to do 22 books of summer for 2022, but that's hubris, I know that. I'm only gonna stick with 20. The the It's supposed to be 20 every year. I'm gonna stick with 20. It's easier to do 20. I don't know why I'm talking about it. I, I've said 20 a lot in this sentence. So thanks for watching. Let me know what you plan to read this summer. It doesn't have to be your 20 books of summer, but if there's a book or two books that you're really, really excited to get to over the next couple of weeks or months, uh, I would love to hear it. So let me know in the comments and we'll, uh, we'll keep talking about it. So thanks for watching. As always, my name is Rick and I'll see you guys in a couple days. Bye.